In today's video, we're going to talk about and showcase one of the absolute best decks in Grand Archive, Fire Merlin. And I want to apologize right here to all of the other assassin stands out there. I have crossed over to the dark side. I am now playing Fire Merlin. I still am playing a little bit of assassin, okay? I still like my water, Crux, Xander. Well, maybe we'll talk about that in a future video, but I've actually been playing this Fire Merlin deck the past couple weeks over in the Rogues Gallery Discord and, you know, just casually among friends. And honestly, the deck is as powerful as it is fun. That's right, I'm having an absolute blast with this deck. If you are a competitive Grand Archive player already, you are already familiar with this deck, so hey, there's nothing new for you here, but if you are new to Grand Archive or you haven't really delved into the current metagame, hey, this is going to be a great video for you because this is a pretty uh, standard Merlin fire deck. We don't have anything crazy in here, but it is a ton of fun. And if you haven't checked it out before, I think it is definitely worth checking out. So, you know what? If you like the video, if you like the Grand Archive content, like, subscribe, comment down below, and uh, let's get started. All right, and not to date this video at all, but we're breaking out the Red Zone Rogue holiday playmat for this video with art done by Grand Archive artist Honshu. We still have only a couple of these left on the Red Zone Rogue online store. Links in the description down below if you would like to get a copy of these. These are pretty limited. I only print these during the holiday season. So, hey, uh, if you want one, go ahead and get one. If you're watching this later in the year or earlier in the year, depending on how you look at it, hey, we might have some again during the winter holiday season here in the United States. But without further ado, let's finish the shilling and start check checking out this deck because, hey, I have it all in themed with the season. This, of course, like I said, is a Merlin deck and we are a full Merlin deck. So we are going uh, from the uh, Spirit of Fire into Lorraine, into Merlin 2, into Merlin 3. And I thought it was pretty fitting since I was the one to spoil Merlin Memory Thief. I was like, hey, you know what? I still have a little bit of connection with Merlin, so I'm not betraying my assassin compadres all that much. So let, let's kind of talk about this. Uh, I think I think it's best to start by talking about Merlin Kingslayer because she is so incredibly powerful that she single-handedly makes this deck insane. So she this is the level 3 version of Merlin. She has the standard 3 cost. Uh, she is a crux champion. She also is a mage warrior champion, which is really relevant. She has Merlin lineage, so you have to go from Merlin level 2 into Merlin level 3. She has 28 health, which is quite a bit. She's got that, that warrior health line. And her special ability is, at the beginning of your recollection phase, put a level counter on Merlin. The level counter is really relevant. Then, if there is an even amount of level, level counters on Merlin, draw a card and Merlin's attacks get plus 2 until end of turn. So every other turn, you draw two cards and she gets a buff. Crazy. This card is crazy. And her level increases for other shenanigans. So yeah, this, this is actually insane. And you can combo this really, really well with Merlin Level 2 and Dungeon Guide, which are both great on their own. So Merlin Level 2 is a level 2, 2 cost. This one has no attribute because it's a level 2. Champion, Mage, Human, 22 health. You can... Um, Activator and choose a card from any graveyard and banish it. If it has floating memory, put a level counter on Merlin. So that actually synergizes with Kingslayer. So what you can actually do is you can level up into Merlin level two. And then if you have a dungeon guide in hand, you can activate Merlin, uh, get rid of any card with uh, floating memory. She gets a counter and then you can dungeon guide into uh, Kingslayer. And then on your next turn, since you will have two level counters on her, one from this one and then one during your next turn from Kingslayer, then you get to draw two cards and get plus two and that'll help offset a little bit of that dungeon guide, um, that dungeon guide uh, downside. So I guess we'll, we'll talk about dungeon guide really, really quickly here. So if you didn't know, dungeon guide, great card, key piece to this deck because we really want to get to Kingslayer as early as we can so we can start building those levels and accruing the card advantage from her effect. Dungeon Guide basically lets us level up earlier than we normally would. It's a three cost one three on enter, banish two cards that are in it from your memory. Uh, if you do, level up your champion. And so what's so great about that is once again, you can level up to Merlin level two, activate her, put a level counter on her, and then you play your Dungeon Guide and then go to Merlin level three. And then drawing a card on the next turn helps, helps offset one of the cards that you banish from Dungeon Guide. So yeah, we're running a full play set of Dungeon Guide. So that's some of the cards from the main deck out of the way. We're gonna go over the 
the um, memory deck first. So yeah, that, that's that's the Merlin cards. Our level one is Lorraine Wandering Warrior because she just gives us really good card advantage. This deck is all about card advantage and then just surviving long enough to just destroy our opponent, which this deck is pretty good at. So this is has your level one stats. Um, on enter, materialize a weapon card with memory cost zero from your material deck. We have a couple options here. We'll talk about them. She has your standard 20 health for, uh, for Lorraine and uh, one cost. And then of course we're playing a fire deck. This is Fire Merlin, so we have just the regular standard Spirit of Fire. Uh, drawing the seven cards is a little bit better for us in this deck than the card selection from the other version of the Fire Spirit. All right, so one of the key finishers is the Majestic Spirit. But before we get to that, I wanna go over um, our zero cost options for the swords. So when you level up into uh, Lorraine, you basically have two options here. You're going to either choose your Sword of Seeking, which is pretty just a pretty great sword in general because it has one attack and two durability. You do also get that True Sight bonus, which can come into play here and there, but most of the time it's just two durability so you can attack multiple times with it. Or if you have a relevant unit on the field that you want to buff up for the turn, getting the Ornamental Great Sword is also really, really good because it'll give that, um, that ally plus one for the turn. So yeah, if you really need that damage, you can get this one to help clear the board out. Otherwise, the Sword of Seeking is great if your opponent cleared your board or you don't have any units or anything like that. So these are great options. Uh, getting rid of our swords early is not a bad idea because we want them for our Incarnate Majesty, which we'll talk about as soon as we get through this bit. Uh, other weapons include the Drawn Blade, which is just a great card that draws you a card. Just one cost, draws a card on enter. Really, really good. This is a great one to recur a few times with some other effects that we have. Um, the, let's talk about the Prismatic Edge. So this is one of our few crux cards in the deck. This was really, really powerful. It is a three attack, one durability on enter. Each player reveals all cards in their memory. If a fire element card was uh, revealed this way, choose a unit, any unit. So it could be your opponent's champ, could be one of their allies, do three damage to it. If a water element was revealed this way, draw a card. If a wind element was revealed this way, each opponent banishes a card at random from their memory. So no matter how you shake it, this is really, really good. If your opponent is playing one of the other elements, even better, because you can get those extra effects. This is also another card that you want to uh, reuse multiple times. So this is a great one to save for later. And we'll talk about that when the time comes. Uh, the Crystal of Empowerment is really, really good for setting up your Incarnate Majesty turns because just a zero cost banish it, get plus two level for the turn. Or you can set up a good uh, Fireball kill with this card. We'll talk about that as well when we get to the Fireball. Uh, Terror Ring is really good for slowing down our opponent and making sure they don't kill us on certain turns if they have a lot of allies or a lot of ways to attack. Um, it's just zero cost and then you can banish it until end of turn your uh, players can't declare attacks unless they pay two for each attack, which is pretty brutal in Grand Archive. It's a really great way to slow down the game. And that's what we want to do. We want to get to the late game. I'll save Majestic Spirit for last. Uh, Grand, uh, GCR, Grand Crusader's Ring. Simple, just banish it, draw a card. This is one of the cards that I like to get right after get, uh, leveling up my Merlin. I really try to get to level three Merlin as, as soon as I can, so I kind of start accruing as much value as possible. But uh, GCR can be great when you really are in a bind and you really need it. And then the final card from our uh, material deck is the Majestic Spirit. This is one of our key win conditions. Uh, it's a 12 cost, we're never gonna play it for that. It's a four attack, 10 health, Regalia ally, uh, Beast Mage Avatar. It is a Regalia. So it, it does count as a Regalia for things that care about Regalia, which is relevant. It also has Intercept, True Sight, and Vigor, which means you play this, you smash your opponent for four, and then it just stands back up and it can block all their stuff. It also says Champions you control have Spell Shroud, very good. And then if another Crux Element unit you control would take damage, prevent half that damage, round it up. Hey, guess what? Merlin level three is a Crux Element unit. So she also counts for that. So she also takes half damage um yeah just really really good so basically what this says is your opponent needs to get through your majestic spirit in order for them to progress in the game otherwise it's going to be very 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 hard most of the ways this game uh how, how it usually plays out for me is i do my best to slow my opponent down clear the board play a more like controlling ish style game until I can get the Majestic Spirit out and until I can get my Merlin rocking. And then you just get so much card advantage and you can just kind of like blow them out of the water out of nowhere with a combination of your units as well as the Majestic Spirit. So yeah, that's kind of what we're doing here. 
I have a bunch of really sweet stuff to support all of this. I guess we can go over the sideboard really quick before we uh, look at the main deck proper. The sideboard will be fairly telling as to um, what we're playing in the main deck. So we have a couple main deck cards on the sideboard. We have one Resolute Stand. We have three more in the main deck. You basically side this in against any ally-centric strategy, and you side out the other Resolute Stands uh, for your Rending Flames if your opponent is not playing uh, not playing a deck where a Resolute Stand is relevant. So it's a pretty swap from for the main deck, right? You put in another Resolute Stand if it's relevant, you take out all your Resolute Stands, swap them for the Rending Flames if not. Rending Flames on the sideboard is also kind of cheeky because your opponent is going to see you're playing a Fire and they're going to think that you care about cards in your graveyard, like Fire cards in your graveyard, but pre-sideboard, you don't. You don't actually care. So if they do a Nullifying Lantern, you're like, eh, whatever. Um, once you sideboard in the Rending Flames, you do care and we'd have ways to deal with that. So that's gonna be our main deck sideboard cards. And then we have some other sideboard cards uh, for our um, for our uh, memory deck. So first up, we have the Quicksilver Grail. This is a card that you could swap out for the GCR because it is a Divine Relic. You can only have one Divine Relic in your deck. And it says, on enter, banish a non-champ card from your material deck face down, and you can banish the Quicksilver Grail and play it. Uh, basically, this is just a great, great way to set up like a one-two combo where you can play um, you can play something like your your Tithe Proclamation, your Crystal of Empowerment, um, even like your Prismatic Edge within like a double whammy style situation. And it also enables you to get around some uh, various shenanigans. Personally, I really like the Grand Crusader's Ring, but this card does have a place here and there. Uh, we have the Viridian Protective Trinket. This one's pretty simple. You side this in against water decks. So it just says, uh, during, your, uh, during your turn, water element cards your opponents activate cost two more to activate. This, this Banish thing, uh, that's not true. This card has been errated. It is just the during your opponent's turn. You don't have to banish it. It's just a static effect. Cause zero. So just banish, you bring this in against water decks. We have Nullifying Lantern. You bring this in against other fire decks, especially like the Erupting Rhapsody fire decks or like a Fire Rye or anything like that. Even Fire Assassin. So it just says cards in graveyards are norm element. And this is a situation where you likely will not bring in your uh, Rending Flames. I do want to mention with Rending Flames, I didn't mention this too, but Rending Flames, it's a three cost card, three attack. It says on attack, you can banish three Fire Emblem cards from your graveyard. If you do, it gets whenever this attack would deal damage, it deals double that damage instead. This is nuts, like nutso with uh, Merlin's effect. And then you can combine that with attacks like Prismatic Edge. So that would be a um, 16 damage, just casual 16 if they let it hit. So it's a three from the Prismatic Edge, three from the Rending Flames and two from Merlin, making it eight doubled, 16. Not bad, not too bad. So yeah, your opponent really has to respect the Rending Flames um, with car with their own uh, Nullifying Lantern, which we have ways to remove with Lever Rock on Acolyte. We'll talk about that in the main deck. And then finally we have Tithe Proclamation. I like having this in the side deck because it actually kind of hurts this main deck. And it says, uh, on enter, draw a card, which is great. And it says, players can't draw more than three cards a turn unless it's their first turn of the game. Uh, this is risky for us because we have a ton of ways to draw cards. There are turns we can draw four or five cards easily, especially if it's a Merlin turn where we draw two from Merlin. And then we have stuff like Creative Shock and we have our um, Hasty Messenger. So this one, this one's a, a little bit of a gamble, right? But still really good against, say, like uh, your opposing mage decks, right? They really want to draw a ton, a ton of cards. So yeah. Bring this in against your opposing mage decks or maybe some opposing crux uh decks especially like uh, crux lorraine who want to recycle their uh swords and draw a lot of cards not as relevant now that uh the blade of avarice is banned but still still fairly relevant okay so i've sorted the deck into cards that do specific things right and so first up we have what i'm going to call our finishers that that would be our incarnate majesty and our Fireball. These are the two cards that really want us to be really high level with Merlin, and they are game ending cards. So Incarnate Majesty is how we summon our Majestic Spirit. So we'll pull the Majestic Spirit aside, just so we have easy reference. So the Incarnate Majesty is a 12 cost with efficiency, which means it costs one less for each level we have. And as you will remember, we gain an extra level every other turn. So I usually play Incarnate Majesty when I'm around level six or seven base, from Merlin, um, but then it also has this card costs one less to activate for each Regalia weapon in your banishment, which is why I said it's actually not bad to, to burn out some of your uh, weapons early on 
like some of these weapons here. Uh, so you can have them stacked up, ready to activate your Incarnate Majesty. And the card just says, put a card named Majestic Spirit from your Material deck or Banishment onto the field, which is great. And so normally when I play Incarnate Majesty, it usually costs maybe four for me. And then you just get your Majestic Spirit. I think it's good to get your Majestic Spirit as early as possible and to keep resummoning it if you can. So if you think your opponent can get rid of your Majestic Spirit, sandbagging an Incarnate Majesty is not too bad at all. And there's no way they can put this in your graveyard because it is a Regalia. And if a Regalia would put in your graveyard, it is banished instead. So if they kill it, you can keep getting it back with your Incarnate Majesties. So really, really important. You want to get your Majestic Spirit out, stabilize the board, and just make you really, really hard to kill. So we're running four of these. Um, next, we have the Fireball. Fireball is really simple. It's just a great way to end the game. So it's a four cost, but not really because class bonus costs two less to activate. We are a mage, so... Yes, it will cost two, and it deals one plus a level damage to target unit. And like I said, we will have pretty decently high levels because we get one extra one every other turn, or we can leverage the uh, Crystal of Empowerment to gain an extra plus two levels. And so that's just a great way to just kill our opponent out, especially if you, if you have two Fireballs, doing a Crystal of Empowerment Fireball Fireball turn is a great way to just finish off the game. So we have kind of like a double threat between our Fireball our Incarnate Majesty, and just a very large suite of annoying units. So, yeah, that's that's basically um, the general strategy. Let's talk about everything else that kind of encompasses it. So here we have a big old chunk of card advantage, or just card draw, or however you want to put it. So we have uh, Hasty Messengers, we have uh, Ghosts of Pendragon, we have Creative Shocks, and we have Cremation Rituals. So... Hasty Messenger, it's a key card in this deck. It's just a two cost one, two on attack. Discard a card if you do draw a card. And this is a great way to put cards with floating memory into our graveyard so we can use them to fuel all of the other shenanigans we're doing with our deck. So yeah, Hasty Messenger is really, really good for that. We are running 16 floating memory cards in the deck. We'll get to those at the end. They're less exciting. Just know we have 16 floating memory cards in the deck and you'll want to discard a floating memory card with your Hasty Messenger so you can still get some of that advantage, right? Because if you discard a card that you can still use, then you're not really losing a card. You're at card parity. Ghost of Pendragon is the only other main deck crux card we run instead of Incarnate Majesty. It's insane. It's a two cost three, four, which is nuts. And it's also a crux card, so it gets the bonuses from the Majestic Spirit, which is actually pretty sweet. But it also says, on enter, you can return a Regalia you control to its owner's hand if you do draw two cards. Now, that's any Regalia, right? So you can return any Regalia you control. doesn't have to be a weapon. So cards that you can return is basically any of these. I would choose to return something that has a good on head or on enter effect, like Prismatic Edge is a great one to play. So materializing your Prismatic Edge, doing its effect, and then playing Ghosts to return this back to your hand, drawing two cards with the Ghosts, and then, or not returning this to your hand, but returning this to your memory. Material deck, I can get the terminology right. Um, and then playing it again your next turn, doing that effect again, is just super, super good. You can also do that with any of these other cards, right? Um, yeah, so Ghost is really, really good, um, especially to recur, you know, maybe the Drawn Blade to draw cards. Maybe you want to um, put in your, if you have nothing else, if you just want to zero drop, you can do your Great Sword, you can do your Ring, your, your Crystal of Empowerment. Heck, you can even do something like your Tithe Proclamation so you could draw more cards and get more use out of it. As long as it's a Regalia and uh, yeah, they all work. So yeah, really great card. Just insane, actually insane. Creative Shock, also actually insane. So just three cost, fast, draw two cards, discard a card, class bonus. If a fire element card was discarded, you can choose a unit and deal two damage to it. So yeah, draw two cards, discard a card, deal two damage, really, really good. We really wanna discard a fire element uh, card with floating memory, um, which we do have the Flame Rune Swordsman, which is really good. Um, or just any card with floating memory, basically. Get a ton of value out of this, this card's insane. And then we also have even more card draw with the Cremation Ritual. Three cost, slow, uh, sack a unit, draw two cards. Really good. Uh, you want to sack a, sack a um, sack an ally that's floating memory. A lot of these cards care about floating memory. But uh, yeah, you want to sack an ally with floating memory so you can maximize their use once they die. We have, Like I said, we have a plenty of cards with floating memory in the deck. You know what, let's, let's just kind of quickly go over them. I was going to save them till the end, but let's just go over the floating memory cards since so many cards care about it. So here 
are all of our floating memory cards. We have a ton. So let's go over the ones that you can make use of with Cremation Ritual. So we have the Star Wolf Shieldmate. It's a 0-2 with Taunt and Floating Memory. Just a great way to gum up the board, force your opponent to attack into it and get that Floating Memory. But you can also discard it to any of these effects or you can blow it up with your Cremation Ritual. Running four of those. Uh, same with Honorable Vanguard. Literally the exact same kind of deal. Two costs, one, two with Floating Memory. Discard it, sack it to the Ritual. You're all good. Uh, then we have the Flame Rune Swordsman. I really like playing this guy out because he's a 2-2 two -two with Floating Memory, so you can actually still attack and be aggressive with him and kind of pose a threat. So having like this guy on the field, plus like a Ghost and something, you know, your Incarnate Majesty, your Majestic, majestic Spirit, it's a lot of damage your opponent has to get through. And it's just really annoying to kill because they don't want to give you that Floating Memory. So, yeah. But also he's fantastic to discard to the Creative Shock, so you can get that, bonus, that two damage bonus. So, yeah, really good. And then finally, we have uh, Fast Cure. Not uh, not an ally that you can sack to the Cremation Ritual, but still really, really good. Uh, has Floating Memory on it, and if your opponent has a greater influence than you, then you get to recover four, so heal four. Also really good. So yeah, like I said, we're running a giant chunk of Floating Memory, so all of these discard effects work really, really well with that. All right, and now we have not that much left. So let's talk about our removal package. So this is our little removal suite. We have the Vrakan Acolyte, which is a three cost, zero one. On enter, destroy target Regalia with memory cost zero. The, the biggest choice that we'll be picking for this is, uh, where is it? It's gonna be our, our opponent's, it's gonna be our opponent's Nullifying Lantern, but you can choose anything else too. If they have any other things just kind of sitting around that you wanna get rid of, you can do that too. But a lot of the big choice is gonna be the opponent's Nullifying Lantern so we can Rending Flames them. Um, but also, if you're level two plus, or level three plus, I'm sorry, which we will very much want to be, since we really want to get to Merlin as soon as, as soon as possible. She also gets plus three attack, so she just also attacks for three ran randomly. So yeah, really good. Good way to push presser and good way to clear out our opponent's uh, Regalia. Really sweet. We also are running uh, two Disintegrates. It's an eight cost efficiency and just says destroy target ally or Regalia. So if we are level eight, it costs zero uh, and just blow something up. Really good, we're only running two in the deck, but it's just a great way to, to get through some of our opponent's stuff, like if they are running their own Majestic Spirit, for example, because this itself does not have a Spell Shroud, it only gives your champion Spell Shroud. So you can um, you can disintegrate your opponent's Majestic Spirit. And then we also have Focus Flame. I think Focus Flame is an incredible card for the current meta. It's a two cost card, but not really, because it costs one less to activate if we are a mage, which we are. And it says, deal four damage to an ally. Four damage, Four. four damage is a crucial point in Grand Archive right now because there are a lot of two threes going around and then there's you know cards like Veiling Breeze that can give all their allies plus one health so three damage usually isn't enough doing four is though you know they can always have two uh, breezes but still uh, four is a really good break point currently in Grand Archive so we're running four of these also it gets rid of a lot of just your other opponents like three fours and other you know four fours that kind of stuff just just really solid just really really solid so that's going to round out our removal package there. Keep in mind that some of these other cards can act as removal too, like Fireball or Creative Shock. And then finally, we have part of my Don't Kill Me package. Uh, Fast Cure is also included in this, and that would be the Resolute Stand that I mentioned earlier. Uh, the best card in the game for not dying to aggro. Um, I guess we'll talk about it because I kind of breezed over it earlier. It's a three cost fast spell, however, or ha fast skill reaction. Level two plus, you may activate this card without paying its reserve cost if you do skip your next draw phase. So you can play this for free if you're level two plus and you skip your next draw phase. And it says, if target unit would be dealt attack damage this turn, prevent three of the damage. So you can do this to one of your allies if you want, but doing it to your, your champion is kind of nuts because it makes it so every time damage would be dealt to your champion for that turn, it's all reduced to three. So your opponent has to deal at least four damage to deal one to them for the entire turn. This card is nuts. This card single-handedly makes some aggro decks just cry. Just cry, cry, cry. I know, I've been there, I played Fire Assassin, and I've had this played on me four times in a single game. More than once, it's brutal. And then finally, Blanche. I love Blanche. I think she's amazing against other fire decks just in general. Um, this is the card that you will likely side out um, in, some, in certain circumstances. Uh, you, can, you can maybe bring in your uh, rending flame so like uh, you can you can side out your resolute stands if your opponent is playing a more spell centric deck or you can side out your blanches if your opponent is playing a more um, ally centric deck 
because Blance is really, really good against spells. So she's a two drop, one, two, a level two plus fast activation. And then it says, if another unit you control, including your champ, uh, would be dealt non-attack damage, prevent uh, an amount of that damage equal to the amount of cards in your memory. This card's amazing at preventing just all sorts of shenanigans. And she protects all units, not just your champion. So yeah, I, I love Blanche and I think running a three of her a main deck is good if your meta is really, really heavy into um, other fire decks mostly, right? And I think fire decks is really popular right now. You have a couple, you know, decks to watch out for. There's like the wind allies, there's the water allies, and then there's all the fire decks. And I think this is great against all the fire decks. But if you, you know, if you're... You know, if your meta is a lot of ally-centric decks, well, you can swap this out for something else and run this on the sideboard. But it is definitely worth running. Blanche is super, super good. And that's the deck. Uh, this deck is super fun to play. You have a lot of, like, board presence. You have a lot of, like, combo shenanigans with, like, fireballs and our incarnate majesty. It's a big, splashy deck where you can go big with your, uh, with your Kingslayer and your Majestic Spirit. This deck really, really hits all the sweet spots for me for Grand Archive. It's resilient with its uh, resolute stands and its fast cures. It has a ton of floating memory. It just feels so good to play. This is currently my favorite deck to play. I'm just having a blast playing this deck. Please let me know what you think in the comments down below. And uh, let me know if you have any other variations of this deck. I know some people like playing the raccoons in the main deck. I know some people like playing um, other variations of stuff here and there, but this is the one that I've I've been really, really enjoying. So thank you all so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, uh, especially if you're into the Grand Archive content. I want to make it do as, as good as possible. And um, see you later.